the National Geographic headquarters, a base camp for those who go farther and yet closer. Come inside National Geographic and meet Nick Davey, National Geographic journalist. I love to explore. I love to meet people and hear their stories. I'm fascinated by the world. Geographic allows me to go out and indulge my own innate sense of curiosity. Being a journalist for National Geographic isn't simply about making television. I'm an activist, I'm a journalist, I'm there to get involved. I think my job is about getting into the shoes of the people I'm making films about. I try to get as close as I can get. The reward for me is that I get to create friendships and relationships with the people. And when that happens, it's magical. The spirit of exploration and the passionate people behind it all only on the National Geographic Channel. Always wonder. Those among you who think it is right to kill your wife if she sleeps with another man, raise your hands. I'm Michael Davey on assignment in Pakistan. Here, a man can kill a woman without punishment. It's a practice called honor killing. My name is Zaheda Parveen. I am 29 years old. I have survived. Zahida's husband mutilated her and left her to die. But she lived. And she did what few Pakistani women dare to do. She fought back, demanded justice, and won an astonishing victory. This is her story, and the story of campaigners like her. It's one of courage, love, and the fight for women's rights. There is a reason to kill. She's our property, our pride. And if she's sleeping with another man, then God says you can kill her. It's a matter of our honor. A woman is to be under my command. My goat, my sheep, my donkeys, my women. My brother set me on fire because he saw me talking on the street to my cousin and he thought we were having an affair. We never get used to the fact that a woman gets burned every day, God knows how many of them. She was a whore in our eyes who deserved to be killed. First we murdered one girl, then after two years we killed another, then we killed one more. These are all arranged planned murders. I don't agree with this assessment at all. That's not the case. Do you think that you were going to die? I was sure I was going to die. I just wanted to stay alive so I could tell my family who did this to me. I didn't want this to happen to any other woman. And I will tell my story. I will tell the truth so this doesn't happen again. <laughs> This is Pakistan, a country steeped in traditional practices dating back thousands of years. I'm here to learn about one of them, a custom known as honor killing, in which the murder of women is condoned, ironically, on moral grounds. Such killings are not limited to Pakistan. They're part of a custom which arose in Central Asia many hundreds of years before the birth of Islam. Pakistan's new government has condemned honor killing but the practice continues unabated. More than three women a day are murdered here, many just on suspicion of behaving dishonorably. In what ways are women prejudiced against? In what ways are women oppressed in Pakistan? Traditionally, she is like a, like a machine. She is like a machine who bears children. And when the duty is done, she is kicked out of the house. Women who are simply seen with men outside their family are often deemed dishonorable and killed. Ironically, many rape victims are also murdered for bringing shame to their families. So, Nahida, let me get this straight. In Pakistan, 
If you're a woman and you get raped and you come forward to the police, but you can't prove that you've been raped, you can go to jail for 10 years for adultery. Yes. This, this, this is possible and this has been happening, you know. These so-called honor crimes are not condoned by Islam, although many believe they are. Islam is used an excuse here for everything. As long as you pray five times a day, you can do whatever you like, and that's just not the way it is. In Pakistan, men often only have to claim their attacks are for honor, and the police will usually look the other way. As a result, these crimes appear to be on the rise. In this day and age, I am the man, and I can rape a woman and rape another one after that. I don't have to be scared of being punished. 29-year-old mother of three, Zahida Praveen, survived an attempted honor killing. She's one of the only women in Pakistan to successfully prosecute the attacker, her husband, Mahmoud Iqbal. So, Mahmoud, why are you in jail today? Well, I am here because of the case involving my wife. On the way to a friend's house, I stopped in a small village. I saw Zahida in bed with another man. It happened at night, right after he returned from doing his prayers. He took the children and locked them in the other room. He then started beating me with the handle of an axe. She continued to tell me that she did not know who he was. He hanged me upside down and beat me until my ribs broke. He screamed at me and picked up a knife. I did this for honor. Everyone does things for their honor. First, he cut off my ears. Then he carved off my nose. With pliers in my mouth, he cut my tongue. And then he took out my eyes with the knife. I cut her ears off because she never listened to anything I said. Yet, she would listen to others, even all the men she slept with. I took her eyes out because she would see things that I did not approve of. The worst thing was, I really cared for her and loved her. He tried to cut my tongue so I could not testify. Thank God I could speak and testify. I was once a pretty woman. Now I can't even go for a walk outside. People stare. I can feel their eyes on me. I hear them whisper. I hear the rumors and lies. And I can hear them gasp when they see my face. Do you deserve to be punished? No. I don't think so, because I did it for my honor and pride. It got really quiet and then I fainted. He threw me on the bed and opened all of the ropes that he had tied on me. He thought I was dead. When I heard my son crying, I began screaming. I was screaming, someone help, please take him out. And then the neighbors came. When they saw my face, they screamed. Zahida was three months pregnant with her husband's child when he did this to her. The baby survived. Sadly, Zahida Paveen's success in getting her husband jailed hasn't yet made it any easier for other women to claim their rights. A report commissioned by a previous Pakistani government states that the average Pakistani woman is born into near slavery, leads a life of drudgery, and dies invariably in oblivion. Not surprisingly, the same government suppressed its own report. Pakistan's new leader has publicly condemned honor killing and has promised reform, but so far, little has changed. General, I've, I've spent the last three weeks with women who've had their eyes cut out, their noses cut off, who've been doused in kerosene and set on fire by their husbands. It, it seems to be a big problem in this country. Okay. Are you tackling this problem? Well, again, I'm, I'm really amazed. Where all have you been going? I, I really, uh, I'm sure, obviously, if you're looking for such incidents, you are being taken to such incidents. Uh, but wherever you are being taken, if you think that this is what is happening uh, to a majority of the women in Pakistan, I'm, I'm afraid that is not the case. 
Honor-related or not, crimes against women are all too common here. More than 70% of Pakistani women suffer domestic violence, according to a recent report by Human Rights Watch. Most women here don't even know they have rights. Not surprising in a country where most of the women are illiterate. I'm in southern Pakistan, heading north to an area where I've heard that women are killed by their husbands, their brothers, their fathers on an almost daily basis. I'm going up there to try and find some of the people who are involved in committing these crimes and hopefully they'll help me understand why this type of thing is going on. It's these rural areas where most of the population lives and where the treatment of women is most oppressive. Illiteracy and poverty plague these people, and religious fundamentalism thrives here, creating an apparently harmonious society, at least amongst the men. We've been walking around this market for hours and I haven't seen a single woman. The women simply do not exist on the streets here. On the other hand, finding men around here who've killed women is easy. Honor killing is a tradition which these three men have practiced, claiming it's encouraged by Islam. But many of the local religious leaders who promote this belief are themselves illiterate and don't understand what the holy scriptures actually say. One of the three killers was about to invite me in until he realized his wife had unexpectedly stepped out of her room. He then took me to the part of the house where he killed his 15-year-old daughter. He says he saw her sleeping with a boy there. Masood, could you please ask him to explain what happened the day he killed his daughter? <laughs> Did you did you shoot her in the head or in the back when you shot her? In here. How many? Once? Twice? Just once. Can I please speak to your wife to find out how she feels about this? No, no. No? Why not? No. Does she have the choice if she wanted to talk to me? Would you let her talk to me? No. Thank you. The other two killers then gave me the rationale behind their murders. This is how we see it in our Muslim belief. If we see these immoral things and do not take action, then you are a pig, not a Muslim. It is not a question of manhood, but of being dishonored. We would have been the laughing stock of the community. I'm from a very different culture to all of you. I need you to explain to me what honor killings are. God says, and the Quran says, if we see it with the eyes, we will kill. Why would you do that? It is written in a book that this is what is asked of us to do. Here you can give five rupees to the police and they can be bribed to ignore the problem. The cruelty practiced daily against women in the rural areas has been hushed up in the past. But now the media is focusing attention on the issue, largely through the story of Zahida Paveen. Six months after being attacked by her husband, Zahida gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Zahida was now blind and constantly in pain, but she was determined to fight back. For week after week, she made a four-hour bus journey to the courts and refused her husband's family's attempts to bribe her to drop the case. I stood up for my rights because this could happen to other women. I wanted to set an example for others and not let him get away with what he had done to me. The odds must have seemed insurmountable for Zahida, but she had one enormous asset, her brother Shakir. He joined her to fight the case. I'm outside the courts in Rawal Pindi and I cannot imagine how difficult it would be to be a woman here seeking justice. There are no women here. This place is entirely dominated by men. 
I, I, I couldn't imagine being a rural woman who normally does never leave her house without a male relative coming here and saying, I've been raped, or my husband wants to kill me because he thinks I'm having an affair. It would be impossibly hard. I, I have a totally newfound respect for Zahida and her bravery, and it must be very, very intimidating. Zahida has always been strong. Even when we were kids, she had no fear of speaking her mind. It would take all of Zahida's strength and persistence. She had to battle in the courts for over a year to get justice. Shakir was at her side every step of the way. Together, they found a lawyer who helped them for free. After a year of struggling, their persistence paid off. Zahida's husband was jailed for 14 years. She had won a rare but crucial victory for all Pakistani women. Now Zahida wants to put her husband away for life. She believes a longer sentence will deter other men from committing similar crimes. So she's still making the trip each month to her lawyer's office to work on the appeal. Nahida Mabubalahi is one of Pakistan's few female lawyers. She dedicates her time to fighting for women's rights. Every day she deals with at least 10 cases of violence against women. Like Zahida, she wants a longer sentence for Mahmoud Iqbal. He's of course been sentenced, but I do not think it is appropriate to the thing which he has done to her. This is not enough, because he's going to come out again and be around and maybe harassing her again and again. How dangerous can it be for a woman to try and come forward against her family's wishes and get justice? There is a cultural setup in this country wherein the women have been taught to sit at home and not to come out and not to expose their family members to a lot of litigation. My sister is very brave. She went to the courts even in these circumstances and won the case. May God bless Naheda and Rukshanda. They have done so much for us. We are so poor that we could not even offer them a cup of tea. As a woman trying to practice law in Pakistan, Nahida has endured years of contempt from her male peers and gender bias in the system. Her dedication to helping women comes from facing the same prejudice as her female clients. With all those things in mind that you mentioned, the fact that families put pressure on women, that women who are poor cannot afford to get justice done. Surely Zahida is one of the bravest of all of Pakistan's women for coming forward. Uh, yes, Zahida, I believe, is one of the bravest women. I think she has also set an example for other women to follow. And because she has the willpower and because she has survived, people around her are also now helping her. After the trial, Zahida could well have returned to her village and disappeared into obscurity but her story was propelled onto the international stage by a remarkable chain of events. First, news of her case reached an American reporter, passing through Raoul Pindi at the time, and Zahida's story was soon on the front page of the Washington Post. There, it caught the attention of a Pakistani doctor practicing in the US. Dr. Naseem Ashraf is an educator in women's issues. Education is the foundation stone for progress, and equality and justice in society. When Dr. Ashraf read Zahida's story, he immediately flew to Pakistan to help her. So, Dr. Ashraf, what's the plan today with uh, Zahida? Well, I think we'll go and uh, visit her at home to arrange for her to have as much reconstructive surgery as possible. It's going to require a lot of uh, strength on her part and a lot of patience and concern and love on the part of all of us. Dr. Ashraf is coordinating a team of medical specialists in Washington, D.C. To restore Zahida's facial features, all expenses covered. The goal is to make her look as normal as possible. Since the attack, Zahida has been ostracized because of her appearance. More than anything, she wants to be able to go out without her kids feeling embarrassed. My children began to cry when they saw me. They didn't want to come close to me. When I was in the hospital, none of them came near me. What does your son think should happen to your husband? He keeps on asking me, did dad do this to you? And when I say yes, he says, 
Okay, mother, when I grow up, I will kill him for you. When I see Zahida, I remember all the good days, like she used to cook food with so much love. She used to care so much. Out of all the siblings, she was the best. She was the most beautiful. I love my brother very much. He only earns a little, but he spends all his money on me and the kids. My brother gives me hope, and at times, I give him hope as well. Honor is within. Honor is courage and humility. Honor is grace and honesty. Mahmood Iqbal will never have honor. God knows the difference between his lies and real honor. I don't sense any self-pity in her. She's a very brave woman. Has she inspired you today? Oh, she has touched me to the core. Dr. Ashraf will escort Zahida and Shakir to the US for four months of facial reconstruction. It's a frightening prospect for Zahida to be separated from her children for the first time ever. And it's a big risk for Shakir to leave his job to make this trip. His income must now support both his and Zahida's families. And he's not sure he'll get work when he returns home. There's also no guarantee Zahida's surgery will be effective. But Dr. Ashraf is encouraging. He hopes that Zahida will be able to make a fresh start with a new face. Quietly, he prays that nothing will go wrong. In Pakistan, abused women who fight for their rights are often shunned by their families because they've made a private matter public. But thanks to their courage, a small women's rights movement is now emerging. It's led by a few committed activists like Shanaz Bukhari. Shanaz has transformed her family's home into one of the first private women's shelters in Pakistan. The mentality of the man is that if the woman is not for me, then she should not be for anybody else also. Let me kill her or let me deface her. She has one child and she's full-term pregnant. And he gave her a good beating day before yesterday and threw her out of the house. Since turning her home into a shelter, Shanaz has been involved with more than 400 burned and battered women every year. But her commitment has come at a high cost. Extremist Muslim factions have branded her anti-Islamic and anti-Pakistan because of her work. They've warned her they'll kidnap her children if she doesn't stop. My daughter who can never cook. But such threats have only brought the family closer together. Shanaz's kids not only share their mother's work, they've taken outside jobs to help support the shelter. Mm. Wow. My mom's the best cook in the world. When I can do so many things for the rest of the world, I do just one thing for them, I cook for them. And that gives me all the pleasure in the world. It's for all the mothers, sisters, daughters, friends, that we want to do something. I want to do something. My family wants to do something. We are going to the house of Fardana, where she passed away. Today, Shanaz is visiting the home of a young woman who was burned to death by her husband. He told the police it was a kitchen accident. Stoves don't explode. It is a very easy way to kill a woman. Shanaz says the biggest problem facing the women's rights movement in Pakistan is poverty. Because people who are poor feel pressure to accept money from the attacker instead of pressing charges. The victim's mother has been offered such a bribe. At first she turned it down, but she's wavering. Shanaz wants to convince her not to compromise, but to fight for justice. <laughs> He says Pakistani women always live in fear. Ah. A little bit of disobedience to their husband, to their father, to their brother, to the in-laws, and they would get a bang on their head, they would get a slap on their face, 
and they would be insulted for that. They sure live in fear. This woman wants to see her daughter's killer jailed, but she must survive on less than a dollar a day. And now she has to support the three children her daughter left behind. She says, yes, I hate him, I detest him, but what can I do? You know, these poor people have no spirit. They have lost all their hopes in the system. As Shanaz leaves, the decision is final. The mother will accept the killer's bribe. The price for her daughter's death? $200. Killing females is a crime against the state, not a crime against the fam two families. So what you want is the government to say no more compromises? No more compromises. It's a crime against the government. A woman is no more a human being to us. She is an object. Like an object, we own her. Pakistan's biggest city is Karachi. It's here that most of the country's wealth is concentrated. But the gap between rich and poor isn't just financial. There's a moral and religious divide as well. Behind fortress-like walls, Karachi's wealthy residents live in an altogether different world. They follow the same laws and religion as their less fortunate kin, but money and education distance them from the violent traditions of their countrymen. At this month-long wedding, we were challenged to find a single woman who looked fearful or oppressed. So this is sort of the climax of your wedding preparation? Yeah, this is like the most fun event possible uh -huh. in the wedding celebration, because the other ones uh, get a little tedious, you know? Zara is the son of a powerful land baron from a rural province. He expresses the more progressive values of his generation. Since we've been filming in Pakistan, we've heard about this honor killing thing that sometimes happens. Yeah, that's you, bad I mean, news. This is mostly a rural yeah. phenomenon. And what happens here is that I think a lot of times honor killing is used to sort of disguise killings that are done for reasons of inheritance and reasons of property. So do you think honor has anything to do with it? I don't think honor has anything to do with it, no. No, I think it's mostly pride. And I think a lot of it is money. Because you see, a lot of times people don't want their, people, their children or their sisters to marry outside the family because then that'll divide up the inheritance. I mean, the fact is I could kill anybody and claim that it's an honor killing, you know? I mean, that's not a problem, is it? Zara is a well-educated professional. He's read the Quran and understands that it gives men no special rights over women. I'm, you know, totally like willing to like, you know, hand over the lead to her. I mean, whatever she'd like to do is, is completely up to her. Javiria, the bride, has a master's degree in business. She won't rely on her husband for money, so she won't live in fear like many rural women do. Normally, she doesn't wear a veil. Today, it's for the wedding ceremony. But you're still happy to be a woman here in Pakistan? Oh, I'm happy to be a woman because I know that I, I'm strong and I have the strength to do something here for the women. And like I said, I'm really, really lucky that I got such a wonderful family and such a wonderful husband. Just settling the nerves there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, beer and a cigarette, always good before you get married. Got it, yeah. You know, I do it every time when I get married. <laughs> Tonight you're going through a, a very traditional yeah, ceremony, you've got your face covered. Yeah. Do you feel like a liberated woman? Do you feel like a woman who has freedom in Pakistan? Oh yeah, definitely. This, this, is, just the, this is just something I have to do. And basically, I'm free to do what I want to in Pakistan. Zara will one day inherit his father's land and power. He'll have great influence over the lives of the people in his rural areas. Mostly when I go to the villages, all I see is the men sitting on their chaatpais and smoking hash, you know. And that's pretty much all they do from all that I've seen. It's the women who carry it. Zara says he'll use his position to sensitize his countrymen and educate the women. Without these basics, he believes that no progress can be made. Zahida Paveen and her brother have never traveled more than 100 miles from their isolated village. They've come to Washington with the generous help of Dr. Ashraf and his colleagues. Now Zahida will undergo the next step in rebuilding her life. 
What are your greatest hopes for Zahida now that she's here in the United States? Well, I hope that she would have fun, that she would be over with her surgery, get her prosthesis, and then she'd be able to be as independent as is humanly possible. And that's our goal and that's our hope. She's remarkably in good health, both uh, psychologically and physically. Hi. Hello. This is Zahida. I'm uh, Dr. Ashraf. Oh, nice Dr. to meet you. See Dr. Dufresne. Yes. He'll Dr. Right Craig Dufresne is a plastic surgeon. He frequently donates his time to rebuilding the facial features of trauma victims. And after being contacted by National Geographic, he volunteered to perform the first stage of Zahida's reconstruction. Hello. How are you? Are you cold? Is she shaking? Are you cold? We turn up the heat a little bit more. Dr. Dufresne will use skin grafts to cover Zahida's wounds. These will provide a stable platform for her new ears, eyes, and nose. His colleagues, Dr. Mike Singer and Bob Barron, have volunteered to design and sculpt her new facial parts. Yeah, that photograph is good to have. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll want to duplicate that anyway. You can take it, we got to. Oh. It's very nice meeting you, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, next week. Okay? Yes. Yes. Thank you. We'll take care. We'll take care, we'll take care, care of you. Of you. Innova Fairfax Hospital and its staff have agreed to help Zahida for no charge. She survived. she survived all this, and she was six months pregnant. Oh, my God. Tell her to pick out a nice dream, because we're going to start to give her some medicines. I think using the techniques and tools we have available to us, I think we can restore probably 80 to 90 percent of her facial appearance. In many ways, this is a, a marriage of medicine and, and art, science. All right, I need the local, and we're going to trim this back here. And then what I'm going to do is take off the mucosal portion of that. This will allow this to heal, to withstand the uh, climate that she lives in. Uh, it will also hold up to the uh, stress and strain of the prosthesis lying on this. We can change the mask of the face, but, uh, you know, she has to live with the nightmares that I'm sure she has to live with every night. I just can't imagine the amount of pain that she was feeling while this was occurring. To get her the best aesthetic result, we have to expand her eyelids, stretch them out, expand the pocket here so that the prosthesis can be made to be life size and sort of balance all the, um, the proportions of her face and facial aesthetics. You have the upper eyelid filled out, you have the lower eyelid filled out, you have a much more natural draping of the tissues. So I think everything went very well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Morning's are here. How are you today? Yeah. You're looking much better today. Yeah, the swelling is starting to go down. Well, this is, uh, like I said, this is this the groundwork, and uh, from here we, we build. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you very Thank much. Good. <laughs> now, um, the change in her face when she hears people talk like her brother was talking to me and I was talking to my wife, etc. That whole whole face has changed. It has an impact on her. She's beginning to smile. She's beginning to, you know, take that in a very positive way. I stay alveda then. She's happy, yeah. <laughs> Zahida will now wait for her new ears, eyes, and nose to be created, but she's already regaining her confidence. Zahida's story has been well covered by the American press. The attention has rallied the Pakistani community in Washington to a common cause. Tonight, they're holding a dinner in her honor. Able to talk to all of us. I think that's what <laughs> huh? 
Bill doesn't say it more than ever. Do you think she's had an impact on the Pakistani community here? I think it's brought brought us all together. I am thankful to God that God gave me the courage to come forward and do these things. And I'm very happy that I have become an example for the women of my country. You know, if she can go through something like this, you know, we can go through anything. And it's so easy sometimes to say, oh, you know, I have these problems and those problems. But when you meet someone like her, you realize what, what life is really about, just fighting on. And also for her children, and as they grow older, and um, they'll be able to see their mother as as a real person, more than a mutilated one. <laughs> so I think she's kind of brought an issue that we need to address closer to home. It's so easy to read about it and then feel bad for someone temporarily the day that that story is over. But this, she's like an ongoing story, and she just she brings it closer to home and reminds us what we still have to do. Back in Pakistan, more honor crimes are being reported every month. The president has promised better services for the victims. He's even set up some shelters, but they're under-resourced and inaccessible to most rural women. His priority is military defense, so the only current hope for many female victims of violence is independent activists like Shanaz Bakari. Shanaz is on her way to help another honor crime victim. But by the time she hears about these cases, she's often too late. The victim has either accepted a bribe or is dying. So Shanaz, where are we going? This is a case of a girl who has been burnt by her in-laws. And then she was kept in a room, not allowed to go outside, lest the world would know what they have done. On the pretext that, OK, if you complain, we are sorry, we will give you a divorce. And I am on my way to go and see in what condition she is. How can we put her into a hospital? And how can we get her case registered in a police station? This oh my God, this is the most Amazing thickly populated. Twenty-four-year-old Farhat was held down by her husband while her in-laws doused her with kerosene and set her on fire. She's been too afraid to go to the police or hospital for help. Now, four months later, her wounds are rotting and she's finally called Shanaz. She still wants to live in. She still thinks that they, they may compromise with her. I have compromise with her. I compromise with her. She's an illiterate woman. She has no education. She knows nothing where to go about. She is not aware of the system. Where should she go first? We should have a burn center which treats free of cost to these women and should have a shelter home where she should take asylum before being burned to ashes. And I hope the government can do some sort of legislation to take care of this issue. Yes, the government needs to participate, but government does not have the funds to participate in these so actively, I would say. But the government spending millions, if not billions of dollars a year on a nuclear arsenal yeah. in this if, country, if, why if, aren't you investing okay. in women? The OK, OK, let country? me answer that. Pakistan has to survive as a sovereign country with honor and dignity. That is priority one. So therefore, the army has to be there. The nuclear deterrence has to be there. The conventional deterrence has to be there. The missiles have to be there. If they are not there, Pakistan will not be there. So what am I going to work for? So I'm afraid you're not well uh, informed on this issue. Unless and until women come to a policy-making level and a very substantial number, not two, three, four, five women, but we are almost 50% population of Pakistan. I don't see any reason why uh, the women uh, cannot be uh, uh, above men in any position. And there are many positions even now 
where women uh, are uh, the bosses. My cabinet secretary uh, is a woman. Uh, my two ministers are women. And uh, every province has a woman minister. Every province. Ooh, my God. It is so exhausting. The following day, Shanaz pulls strings to get Farhad a hospital bed. She also buys her a cotton mattress, which won't stick to her burns. No compromise. You will not compromise. No compromise. Shanaz counts Farhat's decision as a victory for the movement. But she says her most important success is in passing on her work to her children. So how's everybody been? Triple one, triple oh, one, one. We have got this amazing topic we talk about today. The concept of women and development. What is the future of women in Pakistan? And why should you call it women rights? Why segregate them? Theirs is human rights. Do we have man rights? Think about it. It is all about breaking the link of stupidity, of ignorance, of selfishness, of these dastardly crimes, and then moving on, starting a new trend. Letting the chain have a different link. That is what I want to do. So this is why I think I have done a great job, that I have sensitized my own family. That was my duty. I have sensitized a small group of people who will carry on this campaign. This campaign will not finish. I see hope. I see love. And I want to be a part of it, just like my mother is. Ladies, if you have any problems, you can come up here. You, this is your forum. Talk about it. Tell me about it. I can tell the world about it. In Washington, Zahida's trauma has set the prosthetics team on a mission to restore her face. It's been two months since the surgery. She's ready for the next step. But the work's not just cosmetic. There'll be extensive medical and psychological benefits, which will improve Zahida's quality of life. So this is really it goes beyond Zahida to her children and to her village and to her country and to society. You, know, you got to believe. You got to believe that you're here to to contribute to society. Bob Barron was once the CIA's senior disguise specialist. His job was to change the way spies looked now so I, they couldn't be followed. Now that I don't do that anymore, I I feel that I give people back their identities through prosthetics. To see them walk out feeling intact and, want, and as a whole person again, um, you know, it's a wonderful feeling. It makes it all worthwhile. What I'm going to do now Dr. Mike Singer's to trying to make Zahida's prosthetic eyes look real, a task that's nearly impossible because her stab wounds are so deep. Yeah, no, she's smiling and laughing and um, she's doing much better, and I think her morale has improved significantly now that we're actually starting to do the prosthesis. All these ears are made of silicone, and they flex just like ear, they feel like ear. This is my skin texturing tool, and I took this from an orange, okay? It'll make it look like pores, and it has to be the right texture orange peel, so it takes me <laughs> a little time to pick out the right orange in the grocery store. I'm, I'm here for her because she's, she really represents you know, women all over the world, not just in Pakistan. This is my purpose in life, to be able to put hope back in someone's life. Uh, Hold still. <laughs> OK, there, just like that. How about that, huh? How's that feel, Zahida? Now we're going to go to work, OK? Yeah. So that's starting to just blend right in. Let me, let me see your ear, please. Thank you. That's good. I'm going to put just a little bit of color right there. Oh, yeah. There we go. That looks nice. I'm going to put just a couple of veins in there for you, huh? There. 
There it is. Okay. Now we'll put a little vein in there. All right. <laughs> there. Let's try again. What do you think I'm doing? Say that you... No. No. She'll just get very used to them. And ultimately, it will be just like wearing glasses or contact lenses or watches or earrings. Wow. Oh, good. Wow. Very good. Good. Looks very good, Sahita. Now we're going to place the nose tip in place. And very good. All right. Sahita, there we go. Thank you, Sahita. We did it. We did it. Very good. Oh, good, buddy. What is it? 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 What is Thank you so, so much. Thank you. are welcome. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. We right? really, really enjoyed it. It's been a lot of hard work for you, too, to be here for the... Uh, Bringing her back to normalcy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Singer. <sighs> oh. Thank you. Thank you. You're my friend for life. Yes. Yes. As Zahida leaves America, she has little idea of how much she's touched people's lives here, or of the courage she'll inspire in other women when she returns home. Bye bye. bye, -bye. We just didn't want to bring her here, have her undergo the medical treatment, and then just put her back and forget about it. We have plans, and I have raised some money from friends and other Pakistani Americans to set up a very small endowment fund for her children's education so they can go to decent schools in Pakistan and to set her brother up in business in which Zahida would be a 50% partner. Initially, when this thing happened, I used to be very sad because people would say things like, look at what brutal things have been done to her. But now I have changed. And the same people who used to pity me say, it's good to have her back. Look how good she looks. <laughs> 